Thanks, Robert. Uh, As we come to open God's Word today, let's uh, pray. Father, this morning we come to contemplate the death of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We open these pages of Scripture, we hear the story, and we come, Lord, in a sense of holy dread, Christ's death is for us. The one who knew no sin became sin for us. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit might come, open our spiritual hearts and eyes and lives that we might be able to contemplate the greatness, the height and the breadth of your love toward us found in the death and crucifixion of Jesus. So hear our prayer. Give to us understanding, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the text that uh, uh, um, Sue uh, read to us uh, just a moment ago is uh, contrary, to, contrary to most of the uh, popular scripts uh, of our day. Some of you have probably read best-selling books, uh, uh, gone to see uh, the cinema to see uh, blockbuster movies, and uh, in these uh, books and movies, generally speaking, the hero nearly always beats the villain and rides off into the sunset. Rarely, if ever, does a hero of the story die in the script. Well, the passage that we've had read to us is not on any bestseller list, nor is it in any blockbuster script. It's simply recorded for us by a follower of Jesus. It's a record of the death of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And in my mind, there's certainly no doubt that this script has not gone according to the way that the disciples would have wished it to. It hasn't gone the way that those followers of Jesus imagined. However, as the prophet reminds us back in the Old Testament in Isaiah 53, we discover that the death of Jesus Christ is all in accordance with the sovereign will and purpose of our God. And while our hero dies in the script, it's not the final chapter. It's not the closing scene. Because very soon our hero will rise from the dead and the villain will suffer eternal defeat. We're taking a a journey through Jerusalem uh, at this time of the year. We've been to uh, Calvary, uh, uh, sorry, we've been to uh, the Upper Room, we've been to Gethsemane, today we come to Calvary. And we're looking at how Mark records these last days of Jesus' life. Today it's Jesus upon the cross, our crucified Saviour, And Lord. The traditional place where Jesus was crucified is named Calvary or Golgotha, uh, which simply means the place of the skull. Now, in about 312 AD, the Emperor Constantine, Emperor of Rome, uh, became a, a follower of Jesus. Uh, And he sent his mother, Helena, on a uh, pilgrimage to the Holy Land in order to see if the places that were mentioned in the Scriptures still existed. And this was Helena's task, to look for the places of the Jesus story. Well, she discovered many. And uh, today, if you go to the Holy Land, you can visit those places Uh, rightly or wrongly, 
Christians and the Orthodox Church in particular uh, and the Catholic Church have built uh, great uh, buildings uh, over these places. Uh, they've done two things. They've kind of spoilt the place, but secondly, they've preserved the place for, uh, so that we can uh, see, the, well, this is the place where Jesus uh, ministered or died. So very quickly this morning, uh, this is the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, this is one view. It's a huge church inside uh, this building when you go through those doors on the bottom right. Uh, uh, and this is the reputed site that Helena found where the locals said, this is the place where Jesus was crucified. Now, uh, you walk through those little doors there and you immediately turn right and you climb some stairs, probably about 10 or 12 metres high, and at the top you come to this awful, awful looking scene. Uh, this is reputedly the place where Jesus was crucified. Now you can see it's uh, nothing like it was. It's uh, completely covered in gold and silver, uh, and is kind of a, a, a crucifix, a memorial uh, to the death uh, of Jesus. Not very attractive at all. Uh, then you climb down about 10 or 12 metres and at the bottom of that, uh, that view is the embalming stone. And this is reputedly the place where Jesus' body was laid and where it was prepared for burial. Uh, it's a very sad place to be, actually. Uh, this place here, I, I took a photo without any pilgrims at it, but particularly those who have a superstitious kind of religion, you will see them placing hankies on the, uh, on the stone, rubbing their heads on it, kissing it, doing all sorts of things to co try and gain merit in God's eyes for actually uh, being there. Be that as it may, uh, this is the historical site of Golgotha and Calvary. For the Gospel writers, uh, they, it, it took some time for them to realise that Jesus was heading towards the cross. The death of Jesus was not a tragic turn of events. All along in his uh, march towards Jerusalem, Jesus uh, knows that this day is going to come. And the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation reminds us that the reason, uh, this is the reason he came to earth. This is why he took upon himself human flesh. Jesus came to offer himself as an atonement for our sin. And so Mark brings us the events of what happened that day. And he gives us insight to the enormous agony, the suffering that Jesus endured upon the cross. So verses 33 to 37, we see the agony of Jesus in his death. Look, if you've got your Bibles with you, verse 33 at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Mark's very specific. He roots Jesus' crucifixion in a day and in a time and a place. Mark tells us that this darkness covers the land for three hours, uh, six hours from the, sorry, three hours. Uh, darkness covers the land, uh, the, uh, the land. We know that Jesus was placed upon the cross at 9am, the third hour, according to verse 25. This was the time that Jesus was placed upon the cross and crucified. But then at noon, the brightness of the day disappears. It becomes shrouded. The whole land is enveloped in an airy darkness. And this unusual, miraculous darkness lasts for three hours from noon until 3 p.m. 
in the brightest hours of the day, the sun's light is hidden. It covers the land and darkness. And I'm sure for those onlookers that were there, that were observing this crucifixion, this created quite a stir. It was pretty uncomfortable. The questionings began to happen around the cross. Very likely, sounds and, and life became still and silent. Darkness. The issue of darkness when Jesus died is quite significant, I think, because it takes us back to the time of Exodus, when the people of Israel find themselves in slavery. And God is at work behind the scenes to deliver his people from bondage. You will know the stories, those of you who have been brought up in, in church life, how God sent a series of plagues. And the ninth plague was a plague of darkness. So in Exodus chapter 10, the writer records these words. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward heaven and the land of Egypt. Uh, sorry, and the land of Egypt will be covered with a darkness so thick you can feel it. So Moses lifted his hand to the sky and a deep darkness covered the entire land of Egypt for three days. During all that time, the people could not see each other and no one moved. But there was light as usual where the people of Israel lived. And then comes the next plague and the day of the, the deliverance of God's people. Exodus chapter 12. So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. That night at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon. Even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the people of Egypt woke up during the night and loud wailing was heard throughout the land of Egypt. There was not a single house where someone had not died. Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron during the night. Get out, he ordered. Leave my people. And take the rest of the Israelites with you. Go and worship the Lord as you, you have requested. When we open the Bible, when we read the scriptures, sin is often represented by darkness. It is the light of Christ that is able to deliver us from darkness. And this truth reveals the, one of the reasons why Jesus came. It reveals the truth of this great need for sin to be atoned for. So as Jesus hangs in open shame upon the cross, the Father, as it were, turns the lights out. Something horrible, yet something very great was about to occur. And here upon the cross, the Father, our Heavenly Father, judges our sin in the body of His Son. And while this holy judgment is being carried out, maybe God prevented men and women from looking on such a sovereign event. Darkness. Verse 34, then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Brothers and sisters, this is the most agonizing moment for Jesus 
as he bears our sin upon the cross. As God judges our sin in the body of his Son, Jesus feels deeply the separation which sin has caused. The Father has to turn his eyes away. The Father is unable to gaze upon this sin which is placed upon the body of his Son, Jesus. And this is a moment that is completely foreign to our Lord Jesus. There has never been a moment in eternal existence when fellowship with the Father had ever been broken. And as Jesus bears away our sin, as he carries it away and becomes sin for us, he endures this time of separation from God the Father. Paul reminds us of this in 2 Corinthians 5, doesn't he? For God made Christ who had never sinned to be the offering of our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Verse 35, some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he'd drink. Wait, he said. Let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. As Jesus bore our sin upon the cross, he endured the wrath of God in our place. But those who were present, those who were standing around the cross and watching all this, still failed to see him as the Messiah. There's an old Jewish belief, and this belief taught that one day Elijah would come to the aid of the Jewish people in their hour of desperate need. And so as Jesus cries out from the cross, as he senses this this separation from God the Father, there were those who assumed that he was calling on Elijah to come and take him down from the cross. And in this way, the, the, the cross became a spectacle. Men and women were watching. Is this when Elijah's going to come? Is this when Elijah is going to deliver us from the Roman people? Is this the time when Elijah will come to the aid of this condemned man who claims to be the Christ, our Messiah? Elijah didn't come. And in verse 37, Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his laugh. Well, the sceptics were there. The scoffers were there. And Jesus, Mark records how Jesus cries out once more in a loud voice and he gives up his life. And it is at that moment that Jesus willingly lays down his life in order to bring atonement for my sin. Your sin. Our sin. Just like the children of Israel long ago, the deliverer came so that we could be set free. Jesus remi- or Je- it's recorded in Scripture that Jesus said he had power to lay his life down. He's laid it down. And very soon we'll see that he also has power to take it up again. And in spite of all the scoffing, in spite of all the scepticism, these people were unaware that Jesus is not the victim here. He's the victor. He will come triumphant. 
We can't really look at this moment, can we, without recording uh, or thinking of John's record of Jesus' final words. Mark doesn't record them for us, but John does. In John 19, he says, When Jesus had tasted it, that is the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Having satisfied the righteous demands of God, having come and fully atoned for our sin to secure our redemption, Jesus declares here that he has fulfilled the sovereign purposes of God. The penalty for sin has been paid. The debt has been satisfied. Christ has endured in his own body the judgment of God for the world's sin. He has died in the place of sinful men and women. He has fully provided atonement for our sin. And so there's nothing left for him to accomplish. God has been satisfied. Salvation is now available for all who will come to him in repentance and with faith. So he can cry, it is finished. The work is complete. And so right at that moment, verse 38 tells us, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Mark reveals for us this this miraculous event. It's a reminder to the Jewish people of God's holiness, of a place where God dwelt, but has now been opened wide for all. This miraculous event takes takes place immediately following the death of Jesus. The veil within the temple that separates the holy of holies from the place where the priests would come and work day after day after day is ripped into two pieces. And we cannot imagine the enormity of what this would mean to the Jewish people of God from a physical standpoint. The veil is estimated, the the, the piece of cloth that separated the, the, um, the, 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 the temple to the Holy of Holies, is estimated, was estimated to be as thick as a person's palm. It's not just a piece of ribbon, not just a piece of curtain, that, that, that is hung. It, it was a thick, woven piece of cloth. Some scholars estimate that it would take around 300 men to actually be able to hang the veil within the temple. So can you imagine something of the sheer force and the sheer power that would be needed to rend this veil into two separate pieces? The priests that were working in the temple would have been absolutely astonished at this event. And while the physical rending of this veil is hard to fathom, the spiritual significance surpasses greatly this physical aspect. For hundreds of years, this veil, you can see it illustrated there, the Holy of Holies at the end, For centuries, this veil stood between the holy place and the holy of holies. God's presence dwelt with his people as it hovered over the mercy seat there in the holy of holies. It was only the high priest who was allowed through the curtain into the holy of holies. Only the high priest could go behind the veil and he could only do that once a year on the Day of Atonement. 
This veil separated the, uh, separated God from the presence of everyone except the high priest. So on this day, the day of atonement, the high priest goes in to serve as a mediator, to intercede for his people. He takes the blood offering with him that has been uh, brought with the blood of bulls and uh, goats and sheep. And he offers this blood offering behind the veil. He places it on the mercy seat on this day of atonement. The people, the Jewish people are well aware that he is doing this. They're not allowed within this place. They depend on this high priest to stand as a representative between themselves and a holy God. This veil pictures that separation between a holy God and his people because of our sin nature. And as Jesus dies on the cross, fully and eternally atoning for our sin, this veil is torn in two because it's no longer necessary. The righteousness of God has been satisfied fully and completely through the sacrifice of Jesus' his Son. And now all who would seek salvation can come through Christ and have free access to God's throne. Brothers and sisters, do you sense something of the enormity of this? We no longer need an individual to intercede on our behalf to God. Jesus has ascended back to the Father. The scriptures tell us that he now stands as our mediator, as our intercessor. We are men and women who can approach the throne of God with full confidence. We Sinners that we are have been granted the right to enter the presence of God because of the death of Jesus. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2. But now, think about it, but now, Right now, in this place, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were afar away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And there's someone at the cross who recognized this. Verse 39, when the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, this man truly was the Son of God. After watching the death of Jesus upon the cross, he is a Roman centurion a Roman commander over a company of soldiers, he declares himself that Jesus is in fact the Son of God. A hardened Roman soldier saw the evidence at Calvary. He believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Brothers and sisters, we should consider the significance of this declaration. Being a Roman centurion, this man had very likely witnessed hundreds of crucifixions. He'd watched people die on a cross. He'd watched the condemned people curse. As they died, they probably, there were many who probably spoke of the injustice of their death. Now this man is being crucified under his watch but he observes it as so much different about him. There's no cursing. There's no animosity. There's no hatred in his eyes. 
There's no condemnation in his voice. While others died very slow and painful deaths, growing weaker and weaker each passing moment, this man is different. This man cries out with a loud voice. This man, and and, and the sound of his voice reveals confidence. There is strength in his voice. There's a sense of victory as this man dies. Now we can't be absolutely certain, but it does appear from Mark's account here that this centurion reveals saving faith in Jesus. Here was a centurion who saw the evidence and he believes that Jesus was God's son. This centurion comes to realise and see Jesus for who he really, really was. Brothers and sisters, in order to receive the salvation that God offers us, we've got to do and declare what the centurion did long ago. We must see, like the centurion did, that Jesus is the only means and only way of salvation. We must realise that this death of Jesus upon the cross in our place is an atonement for our sin. We must believe on this one who is crucified is the Saviour and Lord of the world. And we too, like the centurion, need to confess him as as the Son of God. Paul reminds us of this, doesn't he, in Romans 10? If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead... You will be saved. What a promise. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Have you done that? Have you openly believed, uh, have you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Have you called upon him to be your saviour? To thank him so much for taking away and er eradicating the sin in your life so that you can be a free people, a forgiven person? This is the enormity of what Jesus' death means for us. And so in verse 40, Mark concludes this part of his story. Some women were there, watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They had been followers of Jesus and had cared for him while he was in Galilee. Many other women who had come with him to Jerusalem were also there. So Mark reveals there were other people gathered around the cross at this moment of crucifixion. And it's rather interesting that Mark points to the fact that there's these number of women watching the events on Calvary. Mark's not a person to waste words. His gospel is pretty short compared to others. But there's a reason why he mentions the women at this point and it kind of becomes obvious in the next chapter. Mark records this fact for us that there were present at the crucifixion and at the burial women. Now you might not think much about this. But these women would have been involved in the, uh, the embalming of Jesus. They would have known where the tomb was. They'd have followed Joseph when the body was carried to the tomb. 
And the implication Mark is making here for us is that these women are important people in the story of Jesus, particularly in the next few days. He doesn't say who assisted Joseph in taking Jesus down from the cross, but these women would have, they would have had their spices, their ointments, They'd have been there ready to prepare the body of Jesus for the tomb. Unfortunately, in the history of the church, and particularly for some of the early church preachers round about the end of the first century, they would have preferred to have men as the first visitors at Jesus' tomb on that Sunday morning. Because in the ancient world, women were regarded as worthless witnesses. Fortunately for us, because we know uh, the early church would have been highly unlikely to make the story up, we discover there are two Marys and Salome and other women who will be key players in the drama that's soon to follow. So we're told that Mary, Jesus' mother, is there. And she's there along with the disciple John. The Apostle John records for us that Jesus spoke directly to Mary and himself from the cross. Mary Magdalene is there, if viewing from a distance. Then Mary, the mother of James the younger, and Joseph, is believed to be the wife of Cleopas. Salome, the wife of Zebedee, the mother of James and John, Jesus' disciples, is there. And Mark tells us, many other women were present who had come to Jerusalem with Jesus. It's interesting that when you read the Gospels, apart from John's record of the crucifixion, there is no record of any men who followed Jesus to this point of the crucifixion, of being near Calvary when Jesus was placed upon the cross. These women were women who were committed to Jesus. And they are determined to show their support for him. They are there to watch what will happen to Jesus as he's crucified. Brothers and sisters, we ought to give thanks to God for the women in our Christian lives. For some of us, our grandmothers, our mothers, teachers, friends, I believe these names that Mark records here serve an example to us of faithful women who were committed followers of Jesus. So we've considered Mark's record. This is a very significant, gracious, holy passage of Scripture. Because it tells us afresh that Jesus has come and died in our place. This Jesus has endured judgment and death that I deserved, that we deserve. He was upon a cross. He believed this was his purpose for coming to earth as a man. He believed that his commitment was to fulfill God's plan of redemption and he showed his great love for us by suffering the agonies of the cross. Brothers and sisters, have you trusted in this Jesus? Do you know him? Can we really fully appreciate the depth and the height and the breadth of God's love for us 
in sending his son Jesus to die like this. Have you believed in him? Have you repented of your sin? Have you believed that this Jesus who died upon the cross is able and sufficient to take away your sin? To free you from your guilt? To free you from your shame? To give you new life? A new relationship with God himself? If you've done all that, we should be glad people, happy people, delighted people, because our sins are forgiven and God is our Father. But if you haven't done that, can I urge you to think seriously about what we've said this morning? To read again what Mark records for us. And I would urge you, having thought about it, having read about it, come to Jesus. Declare him to be God's son. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is is Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, around this time of the year, we often read the stories that we, about Jesus that we've just read this morning. And we can read them just as words upon a page. Another story. But Father, we thank you this morning for your Holy Spirit who takes these words of Scripture and applies them directly to our hearts and lives. And so I pray this morning for for us gathered in this chapel that you would give to us a fresh understanding and appreciation of all that Jesus did so that we, his people, might be free. By the words cannot express, human words cannot express what gratitude, what love we owe Jesus for taking our place upon that cross. And Father, if there be any here who do not know you, or maybe some who once declared their love for you but have moved away, who have lost their first love. Lord Jesus, come through your Holy Spirit and speak to their hearts. And as we come to this table this morning, as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, Lord, might this be a holy time for us. Might we dare to gaze upon the cross afresh and see that here the Prince of Peace gave up his life so that we could be free. Father, continue to speak to us, we pray. As we sing and as we partake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.